Today we're looking at techniques for installing backdrops and front fascia. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's been a little while, it's been a little while, uh, but I've been working on my layout as you can see. Um, and I talked a little bit in a previous video about my backdrops and my front uh, fascia, but I felt like it was uh, a time and opportunity for me to go ahead and do a whole video just about those things because, you know, there are different techniques for doing it. I wanted to show you the technique that I use. And um, I oftentimes, you know, on Facebook or Instagram, I see people with some really great layouts, uh, but they haven't put in a backdrop or, or a front fascia yet. And, um, you know, I kind of wonder about that. I think maybe some of that might be that like, you know, at the time you're starting to build your layout, you know, you're like, oh, I don't know how I want to do this necessarily. And so you kind of put it off and then you get to a point where like all the scenery's in and it's almost too late at that point to do anything about it. Uh, but, but um, I wanted to show you the, my techniques here because it is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, it ends up looking pretty good. And uh, yeah, it, I'm not a master model railroader. Um, I have my way of doing things and other people do things slightly differently. Um, and so I just, I recommend you kind of looking around and seeing what everyone's doing before you, before you start on, on it for yourself. Um, but my technique is um, pretty simple and straightforward. I use one eighth inch hardboard. Uh, this is the kind of stuff you can buy at like Lowe's or Menards or that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it is uh, fairly cheap. I think they use it for walls and basements and that kind of thing. Um, and it's just, it's like, a, it's like a really thin sort of a composite board, wood, wood type board. Um, because it's so thin, this is one eighth inch hardboard, it's really easy to bend. So you can see right here, areas like this, areas like this, bends pretty easy. It's easy to cut as well. Um, so you get really nice smooth curves and it looks pretty darn good. Um, my method for attaching my backdrop, we'll start with the backdrop. My method for attaching the backdrop to the layout is really, I'm attaching my backdrop to my wall. I have a one by two um, wood essentially. I don't know what, 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 the, what the technical term for this type of attachment would be, but they're screwed into the wall itself and then the board itself is nailed on top of that wood. And that allows me to, should one day this layout need to come out and this need to return to a normal looking room, I can pull the layout, uh, the, the, the backboard off of those wood strips, unscrew those wood strips, and then there's just, there's just a little bit of filling of holes and painting to do, and then the room is uh, back to normal at that point. Um, you know, as opposed to a bunch of nails on a wall and having to kind of pry it off of the wall itself, right? Um, that could potentially cause more harm that way. So that is how I've uh, attached it to the back wall. I'm using this guy right here. This is a Brad nailer. Um, this has been a lifesaver for me as far as uh, putting stuff on the wall. It's very easy to do, very quick. So I highly suggest something like this for that kind of thing. I actually purchased this specifically for use on the model railroad and I found a ton of uses around the house for it as well. So a uh, good investment, I believe. Let me back up a little bit. So the, the hardboard itself, these are uh, four by eight foot sheets, which I purchased. And then I just ripped it down the, down the center line so that they became two by eight foot sheets. If you're doing a smaller layout or if you're doing one where you don't want to do these big curves here, you can get away with uh, like a two by four sheet if you wanted to do it that way. You would just have more sections where there would be seams that you would have to uh, go in and fill. Um, the, the only real problem with using a, a two by eight foot um, uh, or a four by eight foot sheet is that ripping it long ways, it's kind of difficult. You probably need a table saw to do it or you can do what I did. I didn't want to go purchase a whole table saw just for this job. So I used my circular saw, but I used an attachment. It's like a rail. You can get them at Lowe's. Um, they're about, the, there's, there's the rail and then there's the rail extender that gets it out to eight feet. You're looking at about a hundred bucks there for that. Um, but that rail allows you to cut nice straight lines with a circular saw. If you try to cut it without some sort of guide, because it is so so thin, 
the board's going to want to move around a lot. You're going to need extra pair of hands anyway to kind of hold on to things so that they don't move too much. Um, but you really need that guide to kind of lock everything in place. Otherwise, your, your saw will tend to move, your board will tend to move, and you'll get off of that center line. No matter how hard you really try to cut it straight, it's kind of difficult to do unless you have that rail to attach to your circular saw as a guide. Uh, so back, so back to, to that. So the front fascia, same as the backdrop, one eighth inch hardboard. Um, this, the only like the only difference here is obviously instead of just straight on the onto the wall, you are going to be uh, curving it, contouring it for your layout. Now what I like to do before I go cutting into the hardboard itself is I use cardboard to create my contour for me, and then I. Uh, we'll attach it to the side and take a look and make sure that I have it looking good, looking right. Uh, and then I can use that as a guide to cut my hardboard with. Much simpler, easier, faster than trying to like guess on the hardboard. And as you can see, even here, you know, I, I, cut, a, I cut my car right up quite a bit. And even when I <laughs> got to doing the final cut, I made some adjustments from there. So uh, even my, my template's a little off from what I finally decided to go with. But by deciding, by doing it that way, you can kind of play with it a little bit, get it looking the way you want before you go and attaching it to your layout, just because it gets harder to make those adjustments once it's on the layout itself. Um, when you're deciding on your contours, don't just consider what it's going to look like on the front of the layout when you're doing it, but also consider, you know, you are at, you're at this point starting to work on scenery. So you're going to want to take, a, this is like, Essentially, if you're doing it at this point in your uh, modern railroad construction process, this is like your first uh, go at, at creating scenery for your lab, is creating the contour for where it's your eventual hills uh, will meet with the edge of your layout. So when you're creating these contours, don't just consider the, the, the front of the layout itself, but consider how that hill is going to transition through your scene and end up at the uh, backdrop itself. So when I'm designing these hills, I'm considering how the hill is going to flow alongside my track. This is a perfect time to start to consider things like how water erosion works, because really that's a lot of how hills are formed is through uh, water moving through the area and sort of carving out these paths. And so, you know, uh, take a look at the scenery and the area you're modeling. Take a look at what it looks like alongside the track. Take a look at kind of areas that inspire you in, in uh, railroading and, uh, and make a determination of how you want to contour your scenes based on that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Attaching the front of this is, is as simple as, as brad nails again. Um, I use them, uh, I, I use a healthy amount of them. There's another, uh, there's another method for attaching hardboard, especially front fascia, to layouts, and that is to actually screw it in, and then you use these like finishing washers uh, along with the screw to attach it to that front layout. You want to use the finishing washers um, because this is thin and it's also a little um, pliable. So if you just have a screw in there, somebody kind of bumps it wrong, that screw could easily pull out, or as you're screwing it in, you could accidentally screw too far and kind of rip through through the uh, hardboard into the other uh, side. Ask me how I know, because I've done it before. Um, so by using these finishing washers, which are just kind of like washers that go behind the screw, mm. <laughs> when you put the, the screw and the washer into the, the hardboard, um, that, that wider sort of area helps kind of hold the screw in place, keep it from, getting, from driving in too far, and um, acts as a nice sort of like surface area to like press and hold the uh, hardboard against your layout. So it's just much harder for it to kind of pull out from there. Because I'm, I'm using nails and brad nails for these, I'm using just a healthy amount of them. The nails that I'm using have a very small head so it doesn't really grab onto the hardboard very well. Um, so by just using more of them than um, then uh, uh, just, just by using a healthy amount of them, you can make sure that it stays on there pretty good and tight. I've used it on uh, a portion of my layout already that's been up for about a year at this point, uh, and I haven't had any issues with it coming off. Oh, that reminds me. 
Another pro tip. <laughs> I, um, on a previous layout, I did the same technique with hardboard uh, on these sort of slats. In that one, it was a freestanding layout. The, the big thing, the only difference really uh, is that, um, well, the, the big thing that I did on that one was I glued it and then I also nailed it to these um, uh, pieces of wood that were attached to the layout in, in that particular instance. The problem was that um, I had taken the hardboard directly from the, uh, from the hardware store, brought it into my basement, cut it to the appropriate size, glued it, nailed it to in the, in the position. The problem happened, the problem was that um, the humidity is much different in my layout room than it was at the hardware store. And so by just taking it directly there into the layout room, measuring it, cutting it, throwing it up there, I did not give the hardboard time to adjust to its new environment. What that meant was that it began bowing and it popped off the glue from the, uh, the it popped off the glued on back and popped through the, uh, the nails that I was using at the time um, because it had bowed and moved out of place. So this time around, I took the hardboard, uh, brought it into my basement and then left it there for actually several months before I actually got around to working on uh, installing it on the layout. And by doing that, it allowed the hardboard a little time to breathe and reshape itself, I guess, to um, the humidity and the temperature of my basement. So that when I placed it on the layout um, in this area kind of behind you here, it was already sort of like in its final form, if you will. And I have not had any issues with it kind of bowing out of place or popping off of the backdrop or anything like that. So I would highly recommend everyone do this as well, which is to, when you buy your hardboard, buy it knowing that like, give it, a, give it some time to adjust to its new environment before you go cutting it up, measuring it out, cutting it up, and placing it uh, where it's gonna finally go in the end. I guarantee you, you have much better results if you do that. Everything nailed into place. Now it's time to go back through and fill up holes. So everywhere where there's nails, I went ahead and um, added a little bit of uh, spackle. I use this like lightweight spackle. It works better than um, than than wood putty, I think, because it's it just goes on a little smoother, sands off a little bit easier, uh, and it works really well. And actually, as I'm talking to you, I noticed there's a whole section here where I haven't spackled, so I got to go back and do that. Um, areas where two pieces meet, I fill in with spackles as nicely as I can. And we're going to go back and sand that off here uh, before I go painting it. You can see this section right here, I'm using quite a bit of spackle. I'm going to go ahead and sand that uh, back off and, uh, and before I go painting that as well. Some people will kind of do like with the drywall technique where they will put some tape over there, spackle, sand everything down. I have hung drywall before and I'm terrible at it and my work around tape and spackle ends up looking worse than, than I don't know if it works, it looks worse, but it looks pretty bad. Uh, in this case, I'm able to measure it and get it close enough that I think just a little spackle and a little fill will do the job. Is it invisible? No. I, you can probably get better results if you use the tape and spackle technique like you would if you were, if you were kind of putting up drywall. Um, if you're if you're better at it than I am, but one thing to know with all this is, um, if you do it right, yeah, you might see a little bit of line if you're looking for it. Yeah, you might see you know the the, the depressions where the nails go in if you're looking for it. But if you're doing it right, people are not looking for it. They're not, and if, even if they see it, they're not going to care. What they're going to be looking at is the models itself, the scenery you put in, the trains running through the scene. It, it may be distracting to you, the, the person who's building the railroad at this point, uh, to have it there. But I can tell you that like nobody else is going to care, right? And especially once you get the scenery in there, trees, a painted backdrop, all of that, nobody's going to notice a line running through the, the center of the backdrop at all. Um, there's going to be plenty of other stuff for the viewer to, to look at, for the eye to see, and uh, and they will that won't it won't even show up in photographs. I can tell you that. So, <clears throat> I think that's everything I want to show you in this section. Uh, this is the area of my obviously my workbench, and so I wanted to do a little bit of an interesting sort of uh, cutout here, so I can kind of see the 
what the area in here and take a look at stuff. I'm actually gonna go back and redo this section because I'm not happy with how the contours turned out here. And I've got like this, I've got this shop light right here. And when I'm sitting here, it's very, very bright in my eyes. So I really need to bring this down a little bit further to kind of uh, shade my eyes from that shop light um, when I'm working. So this, this section is gonna get reworked, but that's fine. This is the time to do it. Before you get a whole bunch of scenery in place, if you're not happy with how this looks, make the change now because making it later on is gonna be much harder. Not that it's impossible to make the change, but it's gonna be more of a pain in the butt. So you're gonna be less likely to make the change. So get to where you're happy now and do it there. Uh, we're gonna take a look, one more section over here, and I'm gonna show you some finished uh, backdrop and, uh, and uh, front fascia. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. All right, so here is a finished, well, it's not finished. Here's a hung section of the backdrop. You can see um, it's got kind of an interesting S shape. This was difficult, I can tell you. It was difficult to measure. One thing you wanna do when you're cutting uh, pieces is you're gonna to want to um, line them up so that uh, a, a trim section is on the stud that you're gonna be, or stud or you know, a piece of wood that you're gonna be sort of hanging it from. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that both pieces kind of line up to that. Uh, these sort of like contour bends where it's bending kind of out and around towards you like this, those are easier to do because um, the hardboard is going to want to re-flatten itself. And if you are, if it's pushing against these wood slats that are sort of uh, made to support it, it's gonna hold itself against it, it's not gonna move. This here was kind of tricky. This is a pretty tight bend uh, and it's bent the other way. So it's, it's wanting to like kind of pull itself off of it. Um, what I did was I wet the backside with a sponge and water really, really well to help sort of encourage it to bend. Uh, and then when I put it up there, I use a lot of nails. Um, and so it's nailed on there really, really good. I, got, I even added some more nails after the fact just to make sure that I, I've got enough. I don't think it's moving, but I'm not... I'm not 100% on that. <laughs> there's, there's part of me that still thinks, eh, this could pop off one day. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm gonna do. I may end up coming back here and just adding some more screws in, into this side right here, just so that I know that it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, I haven't decided yet. It hasn't moved, it's been up for a week. It hasn't moved yet, um, but We'll find out, we'll see. Um, I, one thing I did do, oh, I, don't, I didn't have it with me, but I did buy a piece, you can buy like a metal aluminum, I think they're used for like duct work, but they're like a, like a curved bit that's two feet tall. I did buy that and, and my original thought was I'm gonna put that here, run the hardboard to that, and then sort of like tape and, and spackle it to the end. I, I wasn't, I wasn't convinced I was gonna be able to make that transition look smooth and nice enough for that. So I went with this route instead. I think we're gonna be fine here, but you may not want to go with this tight of a bend if you're going with this kind of curve, if you have to curve around a section of wall like this. We're gonna see that same kind of curve on the front here, but it's gonna be a much broader curve it's gonna be, it's, there's gonna be a lot of support in this section anyway. It'll be a lot for me to sort of use to nail to it. So I'm not concerned about it up there. This is a little bit trickier. It's holding well now, but we'll see. So something to keep in mind if you're kind of considering hardboard for this type of, of curve. It looks good. I think when I, once I spackle everything, paint it up, it's gonna look smooth and cool. And we'll see how, how it lasts in the long run. Stick around long enough and you'll probably find out for yourself too. Here we are in a finished area where I have uh, put up the backdrop and the front fascia and it is painted and good to go and done. Um, and I wanted to show you this because, you know, this is not a finished scene. There's missing scenery here. I've got, you know, tools and stuff kind of piled up on here. This looks like, this looks like what a modern railroad looks like when you're still in progress, right? Uh, so it's nowhere near finished, but by having a painted backdrop, painted front fascia, uh, what you get is just a really pretty 
and very presentable scene and this looks really really good and it's very encouraging to me as a model builder to kind of see it looking like this because it gives me a sense of pride um, now people will say don't bother painting your front fascia yet because you're gonna put in scenery you know you're gonna get water and goop dripping down here and you're just gonna have to paint it over again anyway I say go ahead and paint it it's quick and easy to do um, it adds just a ton to it when you do it and then yeah you're gonna get drips on it you're gonna to have to repaint it that's okay just throw another coat of paint over top of the current coat it doesn't take very long to do um, and what you get is like in between that phase you get really good looking scenery so don't be afraid to go ahead and paint this area before you start as you can see right here like I've got areas where like I'm going back through and I'm, I'm kind of at, I'm filling filling in holes and, and doing some uh, you know adjustments here so um, yeah I mean it, don't be afraid to paint it. You can go back and uh, and um, paint again later when you are in a, um, a position to do so. Uh, a couple suggestions about paint. Um, you know, you generally want to pick a color that's more of a neutral tone or a dark tone, something that's not going to distract the eye. I've seen all sorts of different colors of, of front fascia on model railroads. I've seen black. Black looks good. Like a hunter green, like dark green looks good. Um, I've seen white, I've seen red, I'm not a huge fan of the red. Um, I've seen, ooh, I've seen people like stain like oak and stuff on there. That looks really pretty. Very expensive, I'm sure, but that's pretty. Um, I went with a kind of a more of a neutral gray. I actually took a look at some of my old scenery and tried to find a gray that kind of matched it. This was called Rugged Suede is the, na the name of the color from Lowe's. It's kind of a brownish gray. Um, not so dark that it kind of like makes the room feel heavy but not so light that it's like gonna you know get dirty very easily that kind of thing so i think it looks good it stays kind of neutral it sort of um blends in with uh with the scenery and fades away and allows the model railroad itself to kind of take center stage which is what you're going to want to look for um pro tip something i did in the past that i would say do not do is uh don't use flat paint um, I used a flat black on my previous layout and it just collected fingerprints like crazy. It was gross looking. It was, anytime you touched it, your fingerprint stayed there forever. Um, so it, this is a satin color, something you might, you know, use in like a kitchen or a high touch area. Um, so, you know, this is, it looks smooth. It looks nice. It's not super shiny and uh, you can just wipe it down pretty easily with a, 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 a you know, like a cleaning cloth or something. Um, so yeah, so um, that's the suggestion there. Uh, another thing to do is sand when you after you make your cuts, sand off the edges just a little bit, top and bottom. Um, it's a little hard on hardboard to notice the roughness of the edge until you go and paint it, and then that paint catches on to those rough edges and really kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. So I've kind of been going through here again and re-sanding the stuff down a little bit because I'm going to put another coat of paint on top of this here shortly. Um, but uh, yeah, just to take a little extra time and attention to like kind of clean up those edges, and you're going to look great. Um, so I think that's about it for my discussion on backdrops and front phasia. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I appreciate you stopping by. Um, I wish I could show you more of the process of cutting it and that kind of thing, but it's kind of a pain in the butt to sort of film and try to cut at the same time. So yeah, you've cut wood before, you know how it all works. But anyways, uh, yes, thanks again for stopping by and checking out this video. Um, We've got lots of cool stuff coming up in the future, so subscribe and uh, stick around and you'll see uh, hopefully some new vi videos coming up very soon. Thanks again for stopping by. I'll see you all later.